I'll be up there. I think I can see it. You need a hand? No, I got it. Thank you. Whoa. I have to Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carlin Bowman, and it's a great pleasure for me and my co-host today, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution, to welcome all of you and our C-SPAN audience to this afternoon's event to celebrate the publication of Henry Olson's new book, The Working Class Republican, Ronald Reagan and the Return of Blue Collar Conservatism. Henry is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, a former AEI colleague, and a member in good standing of AEI's election watch team. Henry arrived at AEI in 2006, and we soon bonded over politics, and especially what was then a somewhat obscure demographic, what the pollsters called some college, people with a technical, vocational, or community college education. This group was large, about a third of voters, and had a near perfect track record of voting for the winner in presidential elections. This loosely defined group roughly synonymous with the working class, was and is especially important in our politics. In the book, Henry shows how Reagan's preferences match those of working class Americans, transcending left and right, and providing the key to his success. Henry's book is basically divided into two parts, one on understanding the beliefs of the true Reagan, getting Reagan right, in Henry's words, and the other a pointed critique of how conservatives and the modern GOP have lost their way and what they must do to recover it. We have a distinguished panel to comment on both. Their bios are online, so I won't provide long introductions. Henry is going to speak for about 20 minutes, and then we've asked Craig Shirley, the author of four bestsellers on Reagan, including his latest, Reagan Rising, The Decisive Years, 1976 to 1980, to comment on Henry's understanding of the true Reagan. Craig will speak for 10 minutes. Then we'll turn to Bill Galston, who will moderate the second half of today's discussion on the future of the GOP. We're very fortunate to have AEI resident fellow and National Review senior editor Jonah Goldberg and the Center for American Progress's senior fellow Rui Teixeira to comment on the future of the GOP. Rui also has a new book titled The Optimistic Leftists, and he is a major contributor to the democratic strategist's work on the working class. You will be able to purchase copies of Craig's and Rui's books in addition to Henry's after the discussion. This is an embarrassment of riches. We have a very tight timetable this afternoon, so let's get started. Please join me in welcoming Henry Olson. I'd like to thank AEI and uh, uh, C-SPAN for coming to cover this event. It's my first book. I feel like I've given intellectual birth, but without any of the pain of real birth. But tonight, I'd like to start by making Ronald Reagan's last words my first. And these are words that you can see on his gravestone as they sit looking over the beautiful valleys of the sunny Southern California that he so deeply loved. I know in my heart that man is good, that what is right will eventually triumph, and that there is worth and purpose to each and every human life. My book is little more than an extended essay on the meaning of those words and how important they were to Ronald Reagan, and how his incorporation and acting upon those worlds did a little more than change America and change the world. But as Carlin noted, my book is about more than that as well. It's about an argument that the Republican Party and the conservative movement have lost its soul because rather than following the real Reagan, the man who could say those words and make those the words that he wants all of us to remember him by, 
They've instead adopted a false Reagan, a Reagan who instead of being someone who loved mankind, was someone who was in love with an abstract sense of liberty without no bounds, and a man who instead of being somebody who would be pragmatic to make sure that the blessings of America would flow to everyone in the economy, focused relentlessly on a businessman's desire for material self-improvement as the core value of economic advancement. As a result, my argument is that the Republican Party have failed to meet Ronald Reagan's vision that he set out in the 1977 speech to the Conservative Political Action Committee convention of a new Republican Party, a Republican Party where the cop, the farmer, the working man would have a seat at the Republican Party table that would combine conservatives of all stripes, social, fiscal, and cultural, and economic, and defense conservatives into one majority party. The Republican Party remains today, despite Reagan's advances, what it's been since the Great Depression, America's second place party, a party that year in and year out has fewer people who will say they belong to or support their ideals than say they will support the Democratic Party, even as that gap has narrowed in the years after Reagan wrought his changes. The Republican Party can fulfill that promise only, I argue, by recovering the real Reagan and recovering the love of mankind and the approach to which that means one should take to government that Ronald Reagan actually exhibited in his life. So let me elaborate on both of those points. The Reagan point, I'm sure, is the one that is most controversial because it flies in the face of what we've been told. We've been told by what I called in a recent Politico magazine article, the high priest of Reaganism, that Ronald Reagan is little more than Barry Goldwater with a winning personality. A man is dedicated to the overthrow of the New Deal, as was Goldwater and the early conservatives and are today's libertarians. In fact, nothing could be further than the case. From his earliest days as a conservative, Ronald Reagan exhibited fidelity to the core innovations of the New Deal in the sense that government at local and a state level if necessary, but at a federal level, or if possible, but at a federal level if necessary, should ensure that Americans have a hand up in American life and that everyone has a chance to live a life of their own choosing, even if it requires some government assistance. And then I'll move on to the second point, which is explaining why it is I think Republicans have lost their way and how it is that in a very odd sense, Donald Trump has recaptured some, not anywhere all, but some of the original Reagan insight. And consequently, it's no surprise that Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump are the only two people who with Republican nominees in the last 40 years to win dramatically among whites without a college degree and in the Midwest and winning the states that determine who becomes president and the states and the constituencies that since 1896 have determined which party runs the American national government. So why do I say that Reagan was not an anti-New Deal conservative? Well, it's because that's what he basically was telling people from the moment he stepped out onto the political sphere. Now, most people who have studied Reagan know that he began life as an ardent Democrat. His father was a Democrat. He inherited his father's love of the Democratic Party as the party of the working man. And he added to that his own youthful admiration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He voted for Roosevelt four times. He was an ardent New Dealer. He memorized Reagan's, uh, memorized Roosevelt's fireside chats, according to his coworkers. In fact, he even bored dates by talking about New Deal politics when they wanted to be talking about something else. Mm -hmm. But he continued to be a Democrat even after Roosevelt died. He headed Hollywood for Truman Barkley in 1948. He supported the Democratic nominee against Richard Nixon in 1950. And he continued to support New Deal Democratic ideals in private conversation well into the 1950s, going so far, according to Barry Goldwater's recollection, of calling him a fascist SOB when he first met Goldwater, who were friends of his second wife's uh, parents, uh, Loyal Davis, uh, in Phoenix in the early 1950s. He moved over to the right as he became aware that the Democratic Party was leaving its ideals as he understood them behind. And he had understood those ideals as using government to help the average person. But he instead began to see that the Democratic Party was interested in power for its own sake, a centralizing vision that made government and socialization of America its animating goal, rather than providing assistance to people who needed assistance to overcome obstacles or petty tyranny in their private or in their public lives. And Reagan was a very smart man. 
And he was somebody who read incessantly. He was somebody who read when he was a child. He read when he was on movie sets. He read when he was working for General Electric in long train trips from city to city since he was afraid of flying. And he developed his own philosophy, which is best expressed is one that said that he was for government that would help people have a hand up. He was for social security. He was for labor unions. In fact, at a time when right to work was a major cause among the American right, he opposed right to work. He opposed right to work in 1958 when it was on the California ballot. And when he ran for governor in 1966, he made clear that he opposed efforts to make, uh, to, to make right to work uh, a law of the California land. He said in 1958 that in the past few decades, the government and America had been engaged in a great adoption of welfare projects that came at a great price. And he said that people wouldn't, he did, he did not want and thought that no thinking individual would want to repeal them, regardless of the cost. They represented forward thinking on his part, on, on the, our part. That he doesn't specifically reference the New Deal, but what else could he have had in mind? Because that was exactly the progress of programs that the nascent right in William Buckley's National Review was attacking incessantly. He supported Eisenhower twice while National Review was withholding their endorsement because he was too wedded to the New Deal. He supported Richard Nixon enthusiastically in 1960 as National Review was again withholding their endorsement because Nixon was too enthused with the New Deal. And even as Reagan matured, Reagan continued to uh, adhere to this philosophy. He told audiences in 1961 that no one should be denied health care in America because of a lack of funds. And he repeated that statement in 1964 when he was giving his television address for Barry Goldwater, uh, which made him a national star. He continued as when he ran for governor to express similar sentiments talking about that we would try and engage as governor the private initiative and eliminate bureaucratic control, but that didn't mean that we were going to do away with the extensive programs and supports that had been adopted in those years. When he became governor, rather than make a frontal assault on welfare or Medicaid, which was then only a year old, as some, as he called them, ultra-conservatives urged him to do, he instead pushed through a record tax increase to make sure the budget was balanced. He always claimed that what he wanted to do was make sure that aid only went to those who, through no fault of their own, deserved support, not to people who could get by without government support. In fact, the very use of that phrase indicates his intellectual heritage, because it was that phrase that Franklin Roosevelt used to describe who deserved government support time and time again in his fireside chats. This continued all the way through his presidency, that Reagan continued to tell people and tell Americans that he supported what he called a social safety net, that if you were truly needy, you would be exempt from the budget cuts, even though at the time he considered the economic disaster caused by large government to be the great pressing problem of his time. People who genuinely needed assistance, which included people on Medicare, people on Medicaid, Social Security, and a whole panoply of social programs would remain exempt from cuts so long as they were genuinely and truly needy. And that group was a very large group indeed. He quoted from FDR extensively in his life. He, uh, not only in the uh, ways that he are acknowledged, but in ways that are not acknowledged, that he, his depths was so, his intellectual, uh, um, his intellectual depth was so great that he would quote Ray, uh, Roosevelt at the drop of a hat without even acknowledging it. In 1980, he went off script at the Republican convention to ask, can you join me in, uh, as we begin our crusade together, can we, we join together in a moment of silent prayer? He had just become the first Republican nominee to even mention the hated Roosevelt in a convention speech, citing approvingly the 1932 speech that Roosevelt had accepted his first nomination, calling for a new deal but only the oldest one would remember that Roosevelt's speech concluded also with a call for joining together in a crusade to save America and return it to its people. The famous line that he used to close the 1980 debate, are you better off than you were four years ago, was not only adapted, but the next paragraph or more where he asked Americans questions, are you better off, Do you th you know, is it easier to find a job? This whole section was lifted from Roosevelt's fifth fireside chat where he answered his critics. Reagan was indebted to Roosevelt's vision in a limited sense, in the sense that America should not return to the wilderness of 
liberty that existed prior to Roosevelt's New Deal, where he opposed what had happened was what had happened since then that the Democratic Party was, he believed, in increasingly interested in power for its own sake. That this was exemplified in why he opposed Medicare, which is true that he opposed Medicare. But as he said over and over again in his speeches, the reason he opposed Medicare was because it wasn't necessary. That only about 10 or 20 percent of senior citizens genuinely couldn't afford medical care and that we should help them. And he supported a bill called the Carr Mills Act, which gave federal funds to states to create those programs. And he told a friend in a letter that if more money were needed, he would put that up. But since advocates of what became Medicare continued to push for a one-size-fits-all program, regardless of need, he felt that they were interested in something else. They were interested in socialized medicine or a socialized society, since you could legitimately meet human needs through a much less intrusive and much less command and control system. The Republican Party no longer talks this language. It talks the language of supply-side economics, a phrase that Reagan, in both private letters and in his autobiography, refused to adopt for himself. It talks the language of the entrepreneur, when in fact, when Reagan was running for president, he never mentioned the phrase entrepreneur. The only time he mentions it in a major address from when he lenters the race in 1979 until he signs a tax cut bill in 1981 is in his first inaugural address, where he lists the entrepreneur as one of many American heroes, and he lists it after the shopkeeper, the shop, uh, the consumer, the farmer, the cop on the beat. Reagan believed in a bottom-up economy in which everybody's incentives mattered and everybody's work was worthy. And a Republican Party that gets back to that is a Republican Party that can talk to Reagan Democrats. That after Ronald Reagan, his successors, whether it's George Herbert Walker Bush or the people who were nominated for office after that, failed to attract the support of these people, particularly the non-evangelical Christians who dominate the Midwestern states, because they just didn't see anything that supported, that they found interesting. They didn't see somebody who had that balance between individual opportunity and individual security that they ascribed to the New Deal and that they wanted to see America. They want an America that gives them a hand up, not an America that treats them with hands off, or an America that lays its hands too heavily on in the form of government direction. Donald Trump is many things, and not all of them good. But one thing he did do from the moment he entered into political life as a serious politician in 2015 was operate as a laser beam focus on the needs and wants of these people. He told them that he understood their pain, that they had been abandoned by a government that no longer had their values at heart, that hard work mattered, and that he had their back. And if that meant that he was going to fight for trade deals that might hurt some people on the coast but return their jobs, he was for that. In that sense, he was apart from Reagan in theory, but it's remarkably similar to Reagan in practice, as Reagan, in fact, put trade sanctions on Japan time and time again to fight unfair trade practices. And one of Reagan's proudest achievements was when he put sanctions on Japanese motorcycle imports to save Harley Davidson. Whenever you see a Harley Davidson motorcycle running around, that was because Ronald Reagan stopped them from being put out of business when they felt that they were being unfairly uh, competed with by uh, subsidized Japanese imports. When he talks about immigration, he does it in a language Ronald Reagan would never use. But Reagan signed his compromise in 1986 because he felt that we were losing control of our borders and that the compromise with amnesty was necessary in order to make sure that we didn't have too many migrants that would drown American workers. As he wrote in one private letter, we can't, uh, that economic migrants, we can never take all of them because we never have room for them. It would be, we were, America was so rich that it could never accommodate all the people who would want to live here and take advantage of its bounty. Donald Trump was on to something, and he was on to the missing link that the Republican Party in its talk of entrepreneurship in its disregard all too often for the realities of the way that government has provided individual security through its entitlement programs. He was on to something that the Republican Party has missed. And consequently, he became the first Republican to win the five Midwestern dominated states, the states that are dominated by Reagan Democrats. Iowa, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. He was the first person since Ronald Reagan in 1984 to take all five of those states. The only way forward for the Republican Party, if it wants to remain a center-right party, is to make that coalition solid 
and to expand upon it by attracting back the Republicans whom the negative aspect of Donald Trump pushed away from that party. That party is Ronald Reagan's new Republican Party. That party is a combination of Republicans and conservatives of all faiths and backgrounds, a one that has an ability to speak to people of all creeds, classes, and genders one which gives people a hand up in American life while still continuing the task of reducing taxes where necessary, giving uh, deregulation an added spur, and restoring competition to America's sclerotic public services. It's one that interprets Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal rather than opposes it. It's one that legitimately returns America on the path which it's been on for well over a century one that allows us to accommodate the vicissitudes of economic competition in modern life while enduring, uh, maintaining the enduring truths of American freedom. It's a very hard road to hoe. It's one that will be difficult for Republicans to adopt. But I believe that we can do it. I believe we can do it because in our hearts, that's where most of us already are. It's where the voters are. It's certainly what they said in the, 19, in the 2016 primary when overwhelmingly they rejected the shibboleths of the Reaganism's high priests and rejected the candidates who were running on the platform that had been adopted in favor of the new look of the old Reaganism that Donald Trump was proposing. I'd just like to conclude by asking you a question. Do you think that if the Republican Party and the conservative movement continues to do what it's been doing for the last eight to 10 years, that if it continues to do those things for the next 10 years, that we will be better off. Do you think that taxes and low, will be lower and that regulations will be smaller? Do you think that traditional values will be more respected in American public institutions? Do you think that we will be more respected abroad? Do you think that we will have attracted more people to our cause so that the first time since 1932, more people will tell pollsters on election day and in pre-election polls that they are Republicans than then they say or we are Democrats? Do you think those things will happen? I don't. I think we've been on the wrong course since Ronald Reagan. I think if we had followed that course, we would have been where he expected we would be. And in fact, I think we would fulfill what he told the Columbus Day audience in 1988 when he was in one of his last political speeches. He spoke to a group of Italian Americans and said, I'm going to tell you something I've never said before. He said, the old party of Harry Truman and FDR isn't dead. That the, the little secret is that when the left took over the Democratic Party, we took over the Republican Party. If that had been true, if the, the old party of Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman, the people who wanted security and opportunity, had genuinely found a place in the Republican Party, the entire history of America over the last 20 years would have been different. And I think this is now our last best hope to make Ronald Reagan's dream come true and finally put America on the path where conservatism is the default governing philosophy of America and consequently make uh, America the shining city on a hill that Reagan always dreamed that we could be. Thanks. When Henry and I first spoke about this event several months ago, I asked him who he would like to respond to his thesis. And he said that many people he spoke to asked him, what does Craig Shirley think? <laughs> so we're very pleased to have Craig with us today. And Craig, in 10 minutes, can you tell us what Henry, did Henry get Reagan right? Um, yes and no. <laughs> Thank you, Carl, and thank you, AEI. You know, being here, I, I enjoy book writing, but I also enjoy meeting people. And, and uh, you know, it reminds me of Mae West once said that uh, too much of a good thing is wonderful. <laughs> um, over the course of my four books, six books, um, I've interviewed many, many people from Jimmy Carter to Walter Bondale and uh, Jim Baker and Nancy Reagan and other people like that. But there, was, there were only three people I couldn't interview, and one of them was Alice Cooper. And you say, well, why would you want to interview Alice Cooper? Well, it turns out Alice was a Reagan supporter in 1980. And uh, so I contacted his office out in Arizona. Reagan had, uh, or Alice had contributed to Reagan. Alice had voted for Reagan. No, Alice didn't want to do a debate or do a, a, a interview. And I said, why? And his aide says rather sheepishly, well, 
Alice was drunk. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean Alice was drunk? And she said, Alice was drunk from 1976 to 1983. <laughs> and I said, you mean all the time? She said, yeah, pretty much. Um, so the, the, I think Henry may have discovered uh, there's a lot of joy in uh, book writing as well. I've certainly enjoyed it. Um, someone once asked me, is, is that, what's the most profitable form of writing? Is it, is it op-eds? Is it letters? Is it speeches? Is it book writing? And I thought for a moment, and I said, the most profitable form of, of writing is, uh, is ransom notes. Uh, um, history is written backwards, but live forward, and I think Henry uh, uh, has written that in his, uh, in his book. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about what first surprised Henry, is what I like about his book. Um, first of all, he opens up a new discussion about Ronald Reagan, one that has not been thoroughly and completely examined as well as it should have been. We don't fully know, or at least it's been underreported about Reagan's intellectual maturation. How does he go from a, as he called himself, he wasn't a, he wasn't a bleeding heart liberal, he was a hemophiliac liberal. Uh, is that how does he go from a rip-roaring supporter of the New Deal to a libertarian conservative? And by the way, he was a libertarian. Uh, that's where you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, is that, but it, it, it is an important discussion, which is why we're here today, which is why his book was written, because, it, you know, as Emil Faber once said, knowledge is good. Uh, nobody saw Animal House, I guess. <laughs> uh, I did. It, okay. <laughs> um, is that, how does, how does Reagan go by this journey? What are the effects on him? What does he read? Who does he talk to? What are the effects of Hollywood? What are the effects of, the, of Eureka College, uh, where he's an economics major, where he first learned that Smoot Hawley was a great uh, cause, it was an integral cause of the Great Depression, and he started down the path of becoming a free trader from his economic professor, uh, where he developed a uh, reading of the uh, Vienna School of Economics. Uh, is, is, so it's a worthy discussion, it's an important discussion. Uh, I think also is, is that um, he, Henry writes in his book um, that Reagan's mind and writing and thinking and intellect has been underappreciated, and I think that that's also true. Marty Anderson, who was uh, one of uh, uh, Reagan's closest aides for many, many years, a very dear friend of mine, told me he thought Reagan's IQ was 150 or higher. He thought he was at a genius level, the way he approached things, the way he thought about things, the way he, you know, he rejected the, the, the you know, eeny meeny of, of, of uh, problems who were put to him. He liked to find other solutions. He liked to find third ways, as in combating the Soviet Union, where it was not just on our knees or, or mutually assured destruction, but to work with indigenous third party uh, freedom fighters in Afghanistan and Czechoslovakia and Hungary and Nicaragua and other countries uh, to, to win the hearts and minds of the people rather than just you know, the old way with uh, Vietnam and with uh, other uh, uh, U.S. Uh, responses to Soviet incursions. Um, if you read, and I think Henry has, I'm not sure, but if you read Reagan's columns, if you read his radio addresses, if you read his speeches, you come away realizing this is a very thoughtful man and a man who thinks very, very deeply about things. Uh, and you can see over the years is that he's becoming more mature, more reflective, more, more subtle in his thinking. And it ultimately centers on the rights and dignity uh, and freedom of the individual. And he mentions and he uses the word individual many, many times in his radio addresses and later in his, uh, his speeches, including as, as President of the United States. So I think that's also uh, to commend uh, Henry. Uh, I have three broad areas of disagreement. One is a libertarian. Henry rejects the idea that Reagan was a libertarian. Um, Reagan was a libertarian, but he wasn't libertine. He was traditional on issues like drug use uh, and uh, other, uh, the other excesses of the 1960s uh, flower child generation. But he was, uh, as, as one of Reagan's very unappreciated historians, who was a good friend of mine, John Patrick Diggins, uh, wrote a very important book called Fate, Freedom, and the Making of History. And in the first paragraph of the first page, 
He says, Reagan drew his inspiration, his libertarian inspiration from Thomas Paine. And as a matter of fact, he quoted Paine often. His two favorite philosophers probably were Solzhenitsyn and, uh, and Paine because he quoted them often, he cited them often. Now, uh, I don't wanna get too much into the weeds here, but in the 1980 campaign, he uses a curious phrase. We all say, man and God. Reagan says, man with God. And this is a very interesting intellectualization of how he was able to, as I said, a third way. The synthesis of pain, who's the very flower of the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment teaches that man is at the center of the universe, and Solzhenitsyn, who gives a speech at Harvard in 1979, eviscerating the Enlightenment, tears it apart, hates the whole concept. And you say, well, how can Reagan, how can these two philosophers both be favorites around Reagan? And I think that it's because Reagan synthesizes the two, and he believes that man is a spiritual being, and therefore, if man is at the center of the universe, it's because God wanted him there, and as a spiritual individual, because God is in that man. So there's no contradiction in Reagan's mind by, by being a, a devotee of both Solzhenitsyn and Thomas Paine, because he finds a third way, he synthesizes the, uh, the uh, two positions. Um, is that in 1970, Five, just weeks before he was going to take on Gerald Ford in the Republican primaries uh, for President of the United States. He gives an interview to uh, CBS, uh, and this you missed in your book. Uh, he gives an interview to, uh, to Mike Wallace, who's a good friend of Nancy Reagan. As a matter of fact, they grew up together in Chicago. They used to go to dance lessons together. Uh, and in this interview, it's up at the ranch, and it's in, it broadcasts in November of 75. Reagan goes into great length to explain his libertarian philosophy. He gives a, a, a tutorial, which is actually quite excellent, on the rights and the dignity and the privacy of the individual and how he arrived at this uh, philosophy. And it is very, very impressive. For many, many years, during the 1970s, Reagan used to publicly refer to himself as a libertarian conservative. And I know you cited reason and, and that he said Reagan, libertarianism was the fundamental basis for American conservatism, and I believe he believed that. Uh, he believed it in the abstract, and he believed it in, 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 in practical uh, sense, practical terms. Um, but he was, um, he referred to himself for many uh, years in the 70s as a libertarian conservative. I'm sure that at some point, you know, Lynn Knopfsinger or Peter Hanford or one of them just said, you know, Governor, knock it off. Nobody knows what you're talking about anyway. So, so he stopped doing it, but he really did he did believe in it, um, is that with regard to uh, the New Deal, is, is that, that yes, it's right, he believed in human beings over cash, but it's also true he believed in individuals over state-sponsored, state-managed state economy, as you write in your book. Um, I, you also write curiously that he was a Republican New Dealer. Now, uh, we just got rid of the phrase big government Republican. <laughs> And I would hate to see a uh, Republican New Dealer introduced into, into the lexicon because I don't think he was. When he was a New Dealer, he was a liberal Democrat. As he matured in 62 when he changed party, he had pretty much rejected at least the, at least the, um, uh, the policies of the New Deal because they, they didn't work or he perceived that they were intruding on the rights and dignity of the individual. There were things that he knew he could do and there were things that he knew he couldn't do. But you know, uh, whether it was in, in his diaries where he dismisses Tip O'Neill as a, just an old New Dealer uh, in, uh, in 1975 uh, in Marathon to Jules Whitcover where he uh, you know, uh, rejects the New Deal as uh, being you know, just a, a panacea that's gonna solve everything. By the 1970s, even the 1960s, he's pretty much rejected the politics and the policies of the New Deal. I agree though that he uh, liked the spirituality of the New Deal that it was a mechanism to bring the country together at a time when it needed to come together. Um, the third, uh, uh, the second uh, is the New Deal itself. Um, and he did compare uh, in, in columns and in writings and in speeches, uh, the New Deal to Mussolini's fascism. Um, he, uh, 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 New York Times in 1981 was the same thing, the diary entry, uh, as I mentioned in the book Marathon. So I don't think, I think that you have to look at Reagan's relationship to the New Deal more subtly than just whether he was for it or against it. 
When he's elected president in 1980, the country is in deep recession. We're losing the Cold War, and the American spirit is, is snuffed out. And those are the things that he concentrated on. Those are the three things that... Um, You've got another minute. One minute, okay. Um, uh, those are the things that he concentrated on. Those are the things that were most uppermost in his mind, not getting rid of Social Security, not getting rid of the, the New Deal, uh, programs or anything else like that. And he also was a political realist, is that there was a Democratic Congress, many of them were students, still New Deal Democrats, and Social Security and other social programs were still popular. So he focused on those things that he could do. Um, let me just uh, uh, conclude here by saying I really appreciate this panel, um, but in some ways we've almost gone from underestimating Ronald Reagan to over-intellectualizing him. And I hope that that's not true. George Soltz, uh, his, his very able Secretary of State, he said, you have to realize this is a guy who was a lot of fun. And he was a lot of fun. And that's part of conservatism. Fun is, is the central core of conservatism. <laughs> <laughs> um, who knows? <laughs> well, I guess you learn new every day, every day, don't you? You know, but speaking of, of, of fun, you know, back in the 60s, um, it was the height of the uh, Vietnam War. And, Reagan was, uh, was out walking with an with a aide who's governor, and he's confronted with a, by a rather smelly, dirty, disheveled hippie. Uh, maybe it was Bill Clinton, I don't know. <laughs> the hippie was carrying a sign, and the sign says, make love, not war. Reagan looks at the sign, he looks at the hippie, he turns to his aide and he says, you know, from the looks of him, I don't think he could do either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Craig, and now we're going to turn to Bill Galston. <laughs> Well, I have a million things to say about this book, but you'll be relieved to hear that I'm not going to say any of them. Uh, <laughs> you know, the moderator's job is to be moderate. That is to say, self-restrained. And so I'm going to turn directly first uh, to Jonah uh, and then to Roy, uh, and then I'm going to give Henry a chance, which I think he'll be champing at the bit, uh, to seize, to respond to what he's heard. And then there will be a frank and free exchange of views among the four of you. Uh, we will then turn to the audience for about 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, and I would ask only to reserve, uh, Carlin, to reserve one minute for myself at the end to share with you a unique insight into Ronald Reagan's political philosophy that Henry's book has helped me to see for the first time and perhaps the last. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Jonah. Uh, uh, I don't have a lot of time here, so I'm going to skip some of the pleasantries. Uh, you know, sort of as Henry VIII said to each of his wives, I'm not going to keep you long. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me say up front that I really enjoyed the book. I think the book is, it makes some important points about that. Not just that Reagan isn't quite the person that we understood him to be, but that FDR wasn't quite the person that he is now lionized to be either, and that the, the history here is a little more subtle. Um, it seems to me that, that, that Henry, and I'm not going to do any arguing with Henry about numbers. You know, uh, he's a cephologist, which is someone who studies elections, and he's really, really good at it. I'll leave that to Roy. Um, I, I don't, I, I consider math witchcraft, and <laughs> so I'm not even going to touch it. Um, it. Seems to me that Henry makes three basic arguments, or at least these are the three basic arguments that the debate about this book is going to generate. The first is, is that Reagan was less of a Reaganite, right, than conservatives, the high priests, as he calls them, I've used that phrase about a bunch of people on the right these days as well, um, <clears throat> like to claim. The second is that the GOP needs to shed this cult of Reagan, of this false Reagan, if it's going to fix its problems and become a majority party and do serious and important things. And the third is that Donald Trump, in some ways, proves some of that. Um, I think the first two ones are the more important points. I will say up front, uh, I am not I'm much more in the Craig Shirley camp about this question of whether or not Ronald Reagan was a New Deal Republican. I always thought a New Deal Republican was Fiorello LaGuardia or one of the La Follettes. 
Um, and Ronald Reagan, to me, was not a pro from the progressive wing of the Republican Party. It's certainly not what Nelson Rockefeller and those guys thought of him. Um, but I'm supposed to be talking about the future of the GOP. And so I, I, here is, I think, my fundamental disagreement. And there's much I agree with in the book, and I'll get to that. Sometimes I'm in violent agreement with Henry, but the panel, <laughs> the panel is supposed to be entertaining or at least interesting, and so people want conflict. Um, it seems to me that Henry's making, a, in some ways, the same mistake that he's criticizing so many on the right of. Namely, that he thinks there is this true Reagan, this dashboard saint of conservatism, and if we can just uncover him and, and reveal his true nature, he will, like a lamp, illuminate the path forward for Republicans for all time. And this is the argument you hear from the high priests about the true Reagan. And, um, but Henry's version of the true Reagan is that he was this New Deal Republican. And I'm just not entirely convinced that is right. Um, I think that one of the things that people don't really understand about Ronald Reagan um, I have always thought of. And I, so here's where I absolutely agree with, with, with Henry. I think the GOP for the last, ele last few election cycles, last couple decades, has been crippled by this cult of Reagan. If you go back and you watch the primary debates on C-SPAN of the last you know, couple election cycles, they, you know, in Iowa and in New Hampshire, you get these GOP candidates, and it's like the nerdiest reenactment of Spartacus. <laughs> where they're all like, I am Ronald Reagan. No, I am Ronald Reagan, right? And, um, and the problem with it is that, first of all, if Ronald Reagan were alive today, he'd be 106, right? So first of all, maybe he doesn't have the best grasp of what politics today requires. But I think what, so one of the problems that the GOP has gotten itself caught up in is it's become obsessed with purity and principles. Now, don't get me wrong, I like those principles. I've dedicated my life to those principles. That's what I do for a living is expose, expose, promote, sorry, um, uh, conservative principles. But um, the, the thing is, is that once you get into a contest of who's the purest, you lose sight of what politics is supposed to be about. And politics is supposed to be about persuasion. Go back to Aristotle. It's this idea that if I use reason and logic, I can explain to you why your self-interests are better reflected in my coalition than the other guy's coalition. That's politics. And if instead it's all, I am the purest guy up on the stage, you by definition are excluding people rather than enticing people and bringing them in. And I think the Republican Party has lost its way, or had lost its way prior to Trump, to the art of persuasion. And, uh, uh, and this gets me to my sort of key point about Ronald Reagan. Uh, Ronald Reagan's success wasn't Yes, it had a lot to do with his ideology, it had whatever, however we want to define it. But the big part of it was he was a really good politician. And one of the things he did that almost no politicians do, including Donald Trump, I have to say, is he told stories. He was really good at telling stories. George Schultz tells a story about how um, he brought a speech to Ronald Reagan and said, could you look at it? It's a really important speech. And Reagan looks at it and he says, well, this is a great speech, but this is not how I would write it. And he goes, well, what do you mean? And he says, well, here's what I would do. I would go bullet point, I would go point, point, story. And he writes in story. Point, point, story. And, he's, and what Reagan understood is that the human mind is wired to understand things through stories. Um, most of the, every important lesson in your lives has a story associated with it. The Bible is many things, but at four, at the, at the, at the black letter of it is it's a book of stories. And uh, he understood how to reach out to people who disagreed with him. He said, if you agree with me on seven out of 10 things, you're not my enemy, you're my ally. And uh, that is something that the GOP has lost in part because it's enthralled itself to Reagan. And one of the things that has caused me to be incredibly frustrated with the GOP in the last few cycles, um, is, and particularly with the, the election of Donald Trump, is the way in which um, the very same high priests that, that Henry is talking about have basically beaten back anybody who wanted to be a policy innovator and say, oh, no, 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 this isn't like Reagan in 82. That we just have to cut top marginal tax rates. Well, we cut top marginal tax rates from 70% or whatever they were down to 30 whatever percent. I would like to cut them more. What has two thumbs and likes tax cuts? This guy. But uh, it just goes as a matter of, fa of logic that if you've cut marginal top marginal tax rates, 
down from 70 to 30, you've already gotten a lot of benefit from it. Maybe we should look at things like payroll taxes or look at other things that might help the white working class. And whenever people from AEI or the Ethics and Public Policy Center, where Henry is, or at places like National Review, the Conservative Reform Network, would make these points, there'd be a lot of people, a lot of talk radio types, who would say, no, 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 that's not Reaganism. And then along comes Donald Trump with his populist campaign, and he wins over the white working class for reasons that Henry describes, I think, largely accurately. And all of a sudden, the people who were being uh, uh, denounced as, uh, as, soft, as too soft on conservatism and not Reaganite enough were all of a sudden being thrown under the bus for uh, not throwing out Reagan entirely and, be, and giving in to this populist tide. And maybe, just maybe, if people had listened to people like Henry or Yuval Levin or Ramesh Panuru or some of these other people, Michael Strain here at AI, about applying Reaganite principles to contemporary problems, rather than trying to rerun the 1982 playbook over and over again, maybe we would have made lives better for the white working class, for the, and, and look, and for the black working class. I can't stand all this talk about the white working class as if everything's going great for the black and Hispanic working class, right? I mean, it's the working class. Um, maybe if we had been allowed to do some of these interesting policy innovations that apply Reaganite principles to contemporary problems, we would have won over some of those people the Republican Party and, and, and not let them grow so frustrated that they threw in with this vast populist enterprise that has no serious connection to anything like mainstream intellectual conservatism. And I'll just close with this last point. Um, one of the things that made Reagan an incredibly successful president was that the staff knew what the old man believed. And that is incredibly empowering to the bureaucracy, to the senior, the political appointees. If you know where the old man's coming down on something, you don't have to go ask for permission to do it. You basically get to carry the ball forward. That, um, more than anything else, is the, one of the biggest problems with the Trump presidency so far, is on any given day, he's, you know, he's like a, a, an old, you know, he's like a patient from an old age home wandering off into the snow. You never know where he's going to go. No one feels empowered to actually follow through on a policy about anything. And it makes a lot of serious people un unwilling to enter the administration because they don't feel like he'll get, his back, get their backs when they need it. And that is an enormous problem. And it is, it, is a, it is a sign that Ronald Reagan was a much smarter administrator and politician who managed to keep the tribes together in a way that Donald Trump simply has no intuitive grasp for. And I think that is one of the reasons why historians will not look back and see Donald Trump as much of a comparative figure to Ronald Reagan. Thank you. Thanks. You did it in nine minutes. Congratulations. Rui, I'll see, take if you, my minute. see if you can do even better. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for having me here and, uh, you know, I'm a longtime admirer of Henry's work, and I really did uh, like his book quite a bit. I'm probably the person on this panel, well, I don't know how Bill feels, but who probably is uh, least enamored of Ronald Reagan. Um, but I actually found his, uh, Henry's interpretation of, of Reagan to be compelling, reasonable. I thought I learned a lot from it. Um, and I do think it has a lot to tell us uh, about the future of of the Republicans, which is sort of the subject of this part of the panel. Um, one thing Henry's book makes clear is that if we're gonna understand Ronald Reagan's political success, and if we're gonna understand the more recent successes of the Republican Party, including um, Trump's uh, accession to the presidency, the, the, the Republican Party has become utterly dependent on the white working class. Not the black or Hispanic working class, the white working class. Um, and there are some things that are worth thinking about in terms of that dependence, which kind of, I guess in some ways, one must admire the success of the Republicans in, in continuing to build their success in this group. In 1980, when Ronald Reagan, you know, God bless his memory, I suppose, um, was first elected to the presidency, 70% of eligible voters in the United States could be classified as white working class. By the time Donald Trump got elected in 2016, it was down to only 45%. So they managed to surf that receding wave in a pretty effective way. Um, by 2040, our estimates are at the Center for American Progress. We feel that eligible voters who are white working class probably be down to 35%. By the time we hit 2060, 
uh, 28%. So, you know, this is a group that's going to continue to decline fairly rapidly as a share of eligible voters and as voters in the United States. So that's something to keep in mind when you think about the coalition that Reagan and Reaganism has built. And let's uh, talk a little bit about Reagan and Reaganism, because one thing that uh, one of the central points, I think, of, of Henry's book, and I realize it's under dispute here on this panel, is there's a difference between Reagan and what's now thought of as Reaganism. According to Henry, the Reagan approach, well, you could think of as sort of the loyal opposition to the welfare state. His view was that, according to Henry, don't take away the New Deal, don't disparage it, improve it. And above all, whatever you do, don't take stuff away from people because they don't like it and it's not right. Um, so that was, according to him, where Reagan was coming from. Now, the Reaganism approach that more hegemonizes today's GOP, um, and I think Henry would argue it's not really Reaganism, it's really uh, neolibertarian Goldwaterism with perhaps a soupçon of racially tinged cultural populism. On top of that, um, the general philosophy seems to be let's get as close to the night watchman state as possible. The government should tax as little and spend as little as possible. The New Deal was basically a bad idea. There's nothing more important than cutting spending and taxes. And if that involves taking stuff away from people, well, so be it. You know, as Comrade Stalin said so many years ago, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. <laughs> and I think that uh, if a serious ideologues who are dev devotees of Reaganism, uh, such as Paul Ryan and his, his friends in the Congress, seem to believe that what the heck, if it's got to be done, it's got to be done. So I think Henry's argument is that, in a sense, Reaganism, i.e. this kind of uh, disguised Goldwaterism, has beaten Reagan. Uh, and the philosophy you really stood for, and this was a bad thing. So can the GOP change? Um, by Henry's argument, and he says that in any different ways in the process of his book and in listening to his talk, uh, they have to to attain long-term political success. Uh, their current success, as Henry argues, and it's not an unreasonable argument, is in some ways kind of a fool's gold. It uh, does not represent something you can build long-term uh, a success on, but rather something that's more episodic and has to do with the weakness of the opposition. Um, well, I'm somewhat sympathetic to that argument, but I think we have to be realistic here and look at the way political parties tend to look at things. They look at the gold that you might argue is fool's gold, and they say, it looks pretty golden to me. It looks like we've had a lot of success. It looks like we control the majority of governors, majority of states, we control the Senate, we control the House, we control the presidency, like, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I think that is possibly the biggest obstacle Henry has to really getting people to, to dig into his argument and take it seriously. Um, well, you know, the conservative policy intellectuals and the analysts may have different ideas about what the party should do and what it really needs to do to attain long-term success and, in fact, take that as a serious issue. I think for most politicians, that's not where they're coming from. They look at what's happened and they say, this is good. Uh, so. Then we come to the long-term problem that I think Henry uh, talks about a lot in his book and that we all face here in America. Um, and I want to quote from the sacred text here, that is Henry's book, um, about the long-term problem. Republicans and conservatives need to face some facts. We've been a minority party and movement in movement in America for 84 years. We won elections in that time, but never have we really taken hold of government and changed the debate in our direction for more than a couple of years at the time? In the end, it always seems that government remains big. It remains run by progressives or those espousing progressive values. And the only debates we influence are on the margin or about cost. Unless we change this, unless we change the very nature of the political debate, we will forever be little more than tax collectors for the liberal welfare state. Uh, and let me also quote from something that just came out today by David Brooks, which I think is apropos to this, this discussion. Uh, Brooks argued today in his piece about how the GOP is, in a sense, rejecting conservatism. Conservative policy intellectuals, that's people like you in this audience, I guess, uh, tend to have accepted the fact that American society is coming apart and that measures need to be taken to assist the working class. Um, Republican politicians show no awareness of this fact. And also, conservative writers and intellectuals have a vision for how they want American society to be in the 21st century. Republican politicians have a vision of how they want American government to be in the 21st century. 
Republican politicians believe government should tax people less. So the Senate bill, which has just been on hold uh, for the uh, uh, elimination of Obamacare, would eliminate the 3.8% tax on investment incomes for those making over a quarter mil. Republican politicians believe open-ended entitlements should be cut. The Senate health care plan throws 15 million people off of Medicaid. According to CBO, this program covers 40% of America's children. Brooks goes on to say, is there a vision of society underlying these choices? Not really. Most political parties define their vision of the role of government around their vision of the sort of country they'd like to create. The current Republican Party has iron dogmatic rules about the role of government, but no vision for America. In a sense, they have Reaganism, but not Reagan. So who, in the end, is going to solve the rolling crisis of capitalism, um, <laughs> which Brooks alludes to? I mean, the sort of the way the economic trajectory of the country has evolved, the problems of people below the 20 percent. Um, to paraphrase Martin Luther King, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward the left. And that's the theory of my book, and I urge you to go out there and buy a copy. Um, but that's my view. We shall see if Henry's book helps conservatives prove me wrong. So good luck, Henry. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Henry, uh, you have five minutes to respond, and then I'm going to experiment with a new kind of moder uh, moderation, that is, the moderation of abstention. And, okay. and I will step in only when it starts to sound too much like the McLaughlin group. <laughs> well, I, f I favor your endorsement of bold and persistent experimentation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people have shared their uh, favorite Reagan stories. Mine is one that he told when he was uh, governor of California. He said that a hippie is somebody who looks like Tarzan, walks like Jane, and smells like Cheetah. <laughs> <laughs> Three points I'd like to get to in the five minutes. One, libertarian. Um, I go into this in great detail in the book. Uh, there's 200 or more pages where I go through. But what, the question is, what do you mean by the word libertarian? that Reagan used the term, but it's quite clear that he didn't use the term in the way that libertarians use the term. And it precisely gets onto the question of what role should government have. In his interview with Reason Magazine, he disagrees with the interlocutor on every point. Uh, and for Reagan, you can see that libertarian meant somebody who's inspired by letting the liberty and the individual choice uh, flourish, but not at the expense of social protection. So when he's pushed on a question of should government be providing higher education or should it be financing higher education, he's fine with that. If it gets to the finer libertarian points of private fire departments, uh, which is a, a hyper libertarian point, he believes in public fire departments. Uh, so when you use the word libertarian, Reagan really meant it to mean what I would argue is a liberty-inspired Americanism, not anything close to what somebody who would normally use the word libertarian actually meant. And that gets into the second question, which is what does the New Deal mean? Traditionally, in the era, we've tended to have the idea that there is an antimony between New Deal, which means government's always getting larger, and that government is the arbiter of uh, how a society should develop, and anti-New Dealism which is the polar opposite. And that is, in fact, the way that the early conservative movement drew the debate. Again, I get into this extensively in the book. But what we find is that Ronald Reagan is somebody who was not a New Dealer in the sense of government expansion, government direction. He vociferously opposed that. He was for that in 1948 to some extent. But he was vociferously opposed to that later. But he was not an anti-New Dealer. What he was was for interpreting what Roosevelt did. And I've so far, we have become so far removed from what life was like beforehand. I just want to remind you that before the New Deal, it was legal to fire people who belonged to labor unions. After the New Deal, it was not. Before the New Deal, there was no such thing as comprehensive unemployment insurance. After the New Deal, there is not. Before the New Deal, there's no ex there are land grant colleges, but there's no extensive set of uh, of private univer of public universities and no community colleges. This is all created by state level New Dealers. There's no federal transportation uh, aid of any particular note. The 
supposed New Deal Republican, Dwight Eisenhower is the one that creates the Interstate Highway Act. All of the things we now take for granted as warp and woof of state and federal politics comes into being because of the innovation that was brought about during the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt. Reagan does not reject this. He never rejects this. He explicitly affirms it. He affirms it from the moment he gives speech as a conservative. He affirms it when he's talking on behalf of Barry Goldwater. He affirms it when he's running for governor. He's about cutting back the excesses. He's about eliminating the idea that the bureaucrat rather than the American should be the center of American life. But he is not for turning back the clock. He is not for going back to a pre-New Deal world. And in that sense, he was the only authentic New Deal Republican because people who are Republicans who are otherwise New Dealers were simply really being Me Too Democrats in adopting the old Democratic New Deal government solution that is always more taxes. And instead, what Reagan does is actually craft a third way, a third way between social democracy and libertarianism, and he gives it a name. It's called conservatism. And then the third thing I want to talk about is principle versus ideology. And again, I get into that in the whole section of my book. Reagan is somebody who is a man of principle, but not an ideologue. His 1977 New Republican Party speech, alongside of giving out his vision of what a party should look like, is an extensive critique of ideology as something that puts facts behind principles, that lops off facts that don't fit its principles, like the limbs extending over Procrustes' bed, somebody who could talk about a Procrustean bed and understand what the reference is, and who hadn't read Percy Jackson novels by that time. <laughs> um, Ronald Reagan was a man of conservative principle, but we have mistaken principle for ideology. And ideology is an innovation of the left, Historically, it is a sense that there is a right way of thinking about things to which all facts must conform. It is the way in which conscience of a conservative is written from first principles back rather than what Reagan called were the realities of everyday life. And for Reagan, those always came first. And consequently, as you'll see in my book when you read it, every place where Reagan goes is a conservative. He finds, when he's actually put in power, disagreement among people who discover that he's not the person they think he is. That's true among California conservatives when they discover that he's actually a man of principle and ideology. He changes his mind on the open housing law. He decides that it's more important to accommodate blacks to American life than it is to stand on the principle of liberty and that a man should dispose of his property according to his he fit. And he decides that he's changed his mind on then an open housing law. Ultras, as he called them, were aghast at that. Libertarians were aghast at Ronald Reagan. They opposed him in 1980 and 1984. But in 1980, they said, Reagan talks about smaller government lowering taxes, but he never does it. And that's what libertarians believe. That's why they ran against him and why Ed Clark said in 1980 that Ronald Reagan was the worst of the candidates. And you saw it throughout the presidency, where time and time again, ideologues, the early priests of Reaganism, opposed Ronald Reagan from the right, Jack Kemp, opposed, uh, and Newt Gingrich, uh, both opposed Ronald Reagan's Social Security um, reform in the vote on the House floor. I actually looked it up, Craig, so I know that that's correct. They either abstained or they voted no. Um, and again, it raised taxes as part of a compromise. Uh, Reagan in his diaries derisively refers to people as ultras throughout his career. Reagan was a principled man. He was not a libertarian the way we understand that word. He was not an ideologue. And I invite you to read my book to read the full argument. Oh, and one other thing I'd just like to say. This is, uh, I got an email, uh, uh, I, so I, I wrote a piece in Politico where I laid out the Reaganism versus Reagan thesis. And so Richard Allen, uh, Rich, uh, Reagan's first national security writer, uh, uh, advisor, wrote my boss. Today I read a fantastic piece of Politico by Mr. Henry Olson. This piece, How the Right Gets Reagan Wrong, is spot on, and I'd like to tell him so. So um, at least one person who was there at the beginning thinks that I've got something to talk about. Okay, panel. You have 12 minutes to go at it. 12 <laughs> minutes? I don't think I need no, But minutes. you don't get all 12, Craig. All right, minutes. I'll put my guard up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sometimes confused by Henry's arguments because he says that Reagan's a New Dealer, and then he uh, goes into how Reagan uh, eschewed government, managed economy, and managed uh, and, and big government dictating 
to the uh, to the individual people. And as a matter of fact, he said, uh, I remember in 1981, he wrote in his diary uh, that Tip O'Neill was nothing but an old New Dealer who thought the uh, you know that the uh, 50 states were administrative states to be dictated to by the federal government, and that he oppo and that he opposed that. Um, I think it, one thing is interesting um, is that. Well, yeah, he did write that in his diary. He also said that he wrote in his diary that he wasn't trying to undo the New Deal, but he was trying to undo the Great Society. In 1977, we have to find tough, bright young men and women who are sick and tired of cliches and the pomposity and mind-numbing economic idiocy of the liberals in Washington. Ronald Reagan, and he was talking about the New Deal. Well, you know, what I talk about is that what there was a different... There's the sorry state of affairs has led to Democratic control of Congress for more than 40 years. Right. Yes. And what he's, he's denouncing the New Deal. He's, he's denouncing the failures of the New Deal. What he's denouncing is... He's denouncing he, the failures of the New Deal. What he is denouncing <laughs> is, as he said in one letter to uh, his, um, the uh, father of his one-time fiancé who broke off with him um, uh, after college, uh, that they took, uh, that he felt that things had taken a turn for the worse back in the 1930s. Uh, yes, her name is Muggs. I'm sorry? Her name is Muggs. Yeah, I know what her name, that's her nickname, that's yes. not her actual right, name. Right, right. But, um, <laughs> that's right. Oh, it's it all you learned. Yeah, I actually did some research, Craig. Um, <laughs> good for you. But again, that's what I've said, good. What, I've, good. what I've said a number of times is that Let's take a look at what the New Deal actually did. There was a debate about the future of the New Deal in 1948. The liberal wing of the New Deal broke off from the Democratic Party to form the Progressive Party and openly called for a state-controlled and directed economy. That was part of the Progressive Party platform. The bulk of the Democratic Party rejected that. Ronald Reagan stood with the bulk of the Democratic Party. The in 1948. My point <laughs> is that as things developed, it was increasingly part of the National Democratic Party, and Reagan rejected planning. He rejected centralization. He did not reject the basic core tenets of the popular understanding of the New Deal, which included Social Security, support for people in old age, unemployment insurance, support for labor unions, extensive mass public education. He always supported those things. He did not reject those things. And those things are not anti-New Deal innovations. Can those I, I, things that were often opposed by anti-New Deal conservatives at the time. And what Reagan did was distinguish between the parts of the New Deal that were, in fact, rejections of American life and the parts of the New Deal that could be legitimately adapted to them. And he was always for those latter things. And in I fact, think that's the, the part mistake you are making. By the way, this is my 12 minutes, not yours. Um, the <laughs> actually, mistake you are making, or nine actually, minutes it's supposed whatever. to be between us. I understood yeah, I, this was a debate. Time out. Yeah. Moderator? Wait a minute. Time out. Break. Uh, <laughs> I'm right. Uh, you get 30 seconds to prove it, then it's Jonah's turn. Uh, the mistake you make is that you look at the world statically instead of dynamically, is that the New Deal was the world in the 1930s and 1940s. There was no argument really against it, no intellectual argument for freedom or, or conservatism or privacy or uh, returning you know, power and authority to the states. It was the only argument going. So the only question was, was how big to grow it or how intrusive to make it. That's the only argument that was on the national stage uh, in the 1930s. I think you're also overlooking two other, a lot of things, um, is that the impact of World War II had on Reagan and had on this country because we defeated the Empire of Japan, we defeated Nazi Germany, and to American people it looked like government was working. We built the interstate highway system. Is that so? Reagan was part of the culture. Is, is that is that conservatives doesn't offer an, a, a compelling argument because there's no need for apparently for conservatism because everybody believes that government is good and more government is is, is better for you. I think also you you over there's three other things you overlook. Okay, Craig, Craig, I really am going to have to stop you now so that Jonah right. and then Rory can get um, a break. <laughs> so. Uh, many places to go here. Um, one is, I, I, it seems to be part of the problem is, and I think you're right, the New Deal was a lot of different things. Um, Ray Moley, who was uh, the Postmaster General and one of, back then, 
postmaster general is a really important job, um, and was a campaign aide to, to FDR, he was asked what the idea of the New Deal was. And he said, saying that there's, an, I, there's a theme to the New Deal is like saying the collection of old stuffed snakes, a, old, a deflated basketball, some sho old shoes, and a guitar in your garage were put there by our interior designer. Um, the, the, the whole idea of the New Deal, which, as you, which you referenced, was a bold, persistent experimentation. And so they threw a lot of things up against the wall to see if it stuck. Some of it did with the American people, or some of it did for the economy. A lot of it was awful and abandoned. And I think, that, I think you make a perfectly fine point that Ronald Reagan, as a politician, and this is my point, as a politician, looked at the stuff that stuck and was successful and said, that part of the New Deal, I'm willing to stick with, but the, the you know, Hugh Johnson's NRA and the Blue Eagle, that was fascistic and I can't stand that. And all the other things that were truly above board and outrageous, because there were many, new, there was a second New Deal, I mean, there were a lot of different New Deals. And, um, but I, I think this sort of gets to my, so I'm gonna tell my AI story. And I will say, the American Enterprise Institute was founded in 1938 to be the hotbed of these ideas to fight the New Deal. So there was some work being done. Um, uh, so tw over 25 years ago, when I'm a little policy research nerd, larval creature here at the American Enterprise Institute, um, uh, Josh Moravchik, scholar at AEI, gave a, a Friday talk about, um, uh, about neoconservatism. And I remember being very proud of myself because I asked him a question saying, you know, well, what was Ronald Reagan? Um, and he answered, oh, well, you know, Ronald Reagan was elected to be a foreign policy president, and we, he was smart enough to expand the tent to get the social conservatives and the economic conservatives on board. And a guy named Erwin Stelzer, who was an economist here, got furious, and he stood up and said, Josh, I'm afraid you've got it completely wrong. Reagan was an economic conservative, and he managed to fold into his campaign the social conservatives and the foreign policy hogs. And then Michael Novak, one of my dear friends, <laughs> says, I cannot believe what I'm hearing. <laughs> Everyone knew that the fundamental essence of Ronald Reagan's campaign was social conservatism and being a pro-life and a Christian. And he was managed to make that into a global philosophy that attracted foreign policy hawks and lovers of democracy <laughs> and, of course, economic conservatives who believed in our inalienable rights as from Adam Smith onward and John Locke, blah, blah, blah. And the room went at it was like, it was like that episode of Seinfeld where Jerry gets the entire pizza restaurant to fight about abortion. I was, <laughs> I was very proud that I was the one who set it off, and it went like this for about 20 minutes. And this sort of gets me to my point, is I think it's very difficult to sit, pick any one of these threads from Ronald Reagan, who was very smart, but he wasn't an intellectual, he wasn't a philosopher in the conventional sense. He was a politician who tacked around as best he could. I like your distinction between principles and ideology, although I'll defend ideology till my last breath. Um, but this idea that there is a true Reagan that solves all of these questions about policy issues, I just don't think is right, whether it comes from the, the high priests or whether it comes from what we'll call the, the Olson School of Revisionists. Hmm. Okay, Roy, you get the last comment yeah. before we turn to Q&A in the audience. Okay, um, well, I don't really have a horse, I guess, not really, in the fight about what Reagan really meant and what he really said and how many Reagans he meant on the head of a pin. I'll let you guys fight that out. But I will say this. Um, if we're going to think about what made Ronald Reagan attractive as a politician, what his success was based on, the white working class voters who we now refer to as Reagan Democrats, it seems pretty clear that they voted for Reagan and they liked Reagan because he more represented what Henry says Reagan really stood for, which is sort of this, let's get rid of the excesses, uh, but let's keep the New Deal programs that keep us secure alive. We're gonna get the bureaucracy off your neck, but we're not gonna take anything away from you. I think that's the Ronald Reagan they voted for. And what they did not vote for is what seems to be the reigning philosophy of the Republican Party today, which again is this kind of neo-Goldwater libertarianism where you, this, you, know, you tax as little as possible, but also like spend as little as possible, and you do take stuff away from people because that's the right thing to do. I just don't think that's what they voted for in 1980 and 1984. Okay, audience, uh, you get the next 14 minutes. Uh, and I have two requests. First of all, Wait until the roving microphone reaches you, and secondly, identify yourself before you ask a brief question. No speeches or statements, please. 
Okay, this gentleman in the front. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. This has been very exhilarating. Um, <laughs> my name is Julian Kyle Lewis. I study international education policy at the American University here in Washington, D.C. Um, I would like to know, uh, I, I just left the embassy of, um, of Sweden today, and the Speaker of Parliament for Latvia and Norway were also there. And we discussed the 10% approval rating that President Trump and the Republican Party has across the Baltic states. And we uh, discussed the impression that uh, European nations were having on the college students that we're producing due to our political climate. And I was wondering, what do, what do y'all think um, we can do to improve the perception uh, globally um, due to uh, recent developments uh, here in the United States to incre increase the approval rating and what these nations think of what we're producing uh, on an intellectual and collegiate level right now. Thank, Thank you very, very much. Who wants to take a crack at it? Let me just you brought up a, a related subject, which is very important, and hasn't, hasn't even been addressed here, and that is the Cold War, which was the prevailing issue of the 1980s. In 1980, we were losing the Cold War to the Soviets. The Soviets had gone into Southeast Asia, that, that uh, Nicaragua had fallen, they were in, Af they were in Af Afghanistan, had fallen in 79, they were in, in Africa and Angola. By every measurable standard, we are losing the Cold War to the Soviets. Eight years later, we're winning the Cold War. And in the course from 1917 to 1980, we gave up territory, uh, every president gave up territory to the Soviets until Reagan, and then Reagan's elected, and then in eight years, uh, they don't give up. Uh, and I think, too, is that part of Reagan's, because I said before, is that one of his big uh, goals was the defeat of Soviet communism. And I've always believed that Simpson Mazzoli in 86, which everybody uses as, a, as an example that Reagan is somehow a liberal, was really more about Gorbachev and about the Cold War and him not handing the Soviets a PR bonanza by, by forcibly evicting three, 400,000 illegals in the United States. And at the time we're preaching freedom and we're telling him to tear down the wall is that, and don't forget too, a lot of these refugees were from uh, communist Cuba and communist Nicaragua who had come into the United States seeking uh, political asylum. I don't know what the answer is to your question, but I do know is, is that uh, the Cold War has not been addressed here enough, and I think it is that it would be really uh, terrific if we all kind of addressed ourselves to that as well. Uh, Next, the woman in the front row, and then I'm going to shift over to a different part of the room altogether. Sonia Graham, I'm a consultant. Um, uh, Mr. Tashira, you made the statement that the GOP has no vision for America. Have I quoted you correctly? That's what David Brooks said. David Brooks. Well, I would tend to agree. And, and you would agree. Thank you. I'm going to ask Mr. Goldberg to comment on that, if you would, please. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and no, the reason I'm asking you to comment on it is that the, the, the extension of the statement was that they have a vision for government, but they have no vision for the country as a whole. So would you comment on that? Thank you. Sure. I thought I'd dodge that bullet, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, well... I, I think David has a pretty good point. Um, I think that uh, one of the, I get asked a lot, uh, why are, which I understand there are all sorts of issues with this, but why are Democrats so much better at politics than Republicans are? And for reasons that I think Ray put it out, you know, that doesn't seem obvious to Democrats who don't control any government, but there is this sense that Democrats live and breathe politics in a way um, and they get help from the media, and they get, to, they get to define and frame issues in a way that Republicans never can. And I think part of it, and I don't mean this to be as nearly as pejorative as it sounds, um, is that Republicans, Republican politicians tend to be more normal people. And what I mean by that is not that... Like the president? Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
in debate, I would call that a direct hit. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, one of the liberating things about being ideologically or politically homeless these days is I don't only have to defend who I want to defend. But um, what I mean by that is you have, you know, remember when um, Ron Johnson asked Hillary Clinton that question about Benghazi and she said, at, what po at, what, at this point, what difference does it make? And she kind of won this round. Um, well, you know, 30 years earlier, Ron Johnson was trying to figure out how to get a loan to get another truck to, to get to move pallets of plastic from Oshkosh to, you know, St. Paul. And Hillary Clinton was doing her, you know, st was working at some crazy left-wing law firm or she was doing her thesis on, on Saul Alinsky. There is a sense in which the liberal, the liberals who go into politics just take it and live it much more seriously. And the standard Republican is this guy, usually a guy, who comes from a Midwestern town, who's a little successful in business, he's a leader in his community and his church, and he moves and he says, I want to give back, right? And so they come from this very sort of, I don't want to say myopic, but narrow frame of American culture that does not speak well to big swaths of American culture. Now, Democrats have a similar problem, but, uh, uh, but just sort of the reverse image of it. And, um, and so a lot of Republicans think, I'm going to go to Washington, I'm going to bring my business skills, and I'm going to get, you know, make sure that the accounts payable department runs well, right? And liberals have a vision for what the society should look like. Republicans have a vision that says, just get government out of people's way. We come from, I come from a place with a lot of social capital. I come from a place with a, like, sort of... Uh, strong mediating institutions, and government is the problem there. Well, it's not the problem there necessarily for the inner city. It's not the problem necessarily on the coast. It's not the way people see things outside of red states. And conservatives need to do a lot more work of figuring out a vision about what this country is supposed to look like for people who don't already agree with them. This is the signature problem of the conservative movement today. So you make a really good living only talking to audiences that already agree with you. And that leaves you completely blind to what other people think and how to address them and persuade them about things. And I think it's a real problem for conservatism. And I think that Donald Trump is not helping in this regard. And I don't really care what young people in Latvia think about America. I'm a big fan of Latvia. But um, uh, I do care in terms of what the conservative movement does and its health in terms of, how, of what young people in America think about it. And whatever you think about you know, Donald Trump's base, He's making conservatism in the Republican Party fairly toxic to well-educated, you know, millennials, to a lot of people that should be the future of the Republican Party, and that is something that we're going to have to deal with. I'm now going to turn to this side of the room, this gentleman right here. Uh, Mark Moisure here. Uh, love this panel discussion. We've been talking about Trump and uh, Reagan. Media is something that comes up quite a bit. Ronald, media didn't necessarily like Ronald Reagan. I'd like your guys' comment of how Ronald, give Donald Trump your tips of how he could handle the media like Ronald Reagan did. Reagan didn't shut them out. Uh, Reagan was one of the most successful presidents of the modern era. Uh, the media was not uh, kind to Ronald Reagan. It, it, the um, the night of the Iowa caucuses in 1980 when he unexpectedly lost to George Bush in a huge upset, Tom Pettit of NBC went on national news and said, we've just witnessed the political funeral of Ronald Reagan. Um, and of course, six weeks later, he wins a, a huge uh, uh, victory in the New Hampshire primary. The national media, the Post, routinely savaged Ronald Reagan. Uh, even the week of his funeral, they were writing articles about whether or not you know, he had had affairs. They were writing articles about uh, the state of his and Mrs. Reagan's marriage. The Washington Post was horrendous to Ronald Reagan for pretty much all eight years and even into his uh, death. The New York Times was uh, not much better. Uh, is that the fact of the matter is, is that, but you know, he never really shut them out. He never criticized them. He never uh, went after them. He would, he, he, you know, there was a time where uh, he wrote a letter to Cal Thomas and the LA Times had criticized him and he simply said, well, the LA Times is not my corner. Oops. Uh, and that was the extent of it, is that he was just, he, you know, this is a guy, this, he made 55 movies and some of those movies were really bad. <laughs> some of those movies were really bad, but he developed a thick skin. 
through mm -hmm. all of his, much of his career, you know, is the, the radio career where, you know, you'd get criticism maybe from the local townsfolk, certainly the movie career, uh, is, that, uh, is that his last movie, The Killers, was widely panned. So by the time he's in politics is that he's learned to, to take criticism and not take it, to, not take it too personally. Um, he would let go in his diaries. Uh, is that uh, with people he didn't like or, or, or reporters he didn't like. Uh, he once wrote in his diaries about Senator Lowell Weicker from Connecticut that he was a pompous, no good fathead. Uh, and he later wrote that, uh, that uh, he later wrote something else very, very nasty about Senator Lowell Weicker. So he, he, had his, he had his ways of handling those things, but he didn't do it publicly. He did it in private. He might vent to Mrs. Reagan. He certainly would vent in his, uh, in his diaries. But by the time he's elected president, he's developed a pretty thick skin, so he can turn away criticism, unlike Trump, who can't turn away any criticism whatsoever. Hmm. Uh, yes. Uh, the woman in the second row, and then if there's time, I'll take one more question. Anna smith Lacey, Hungary Initiatives Foundation. About six years ago, several countries in Central and Eastern Europe inaugurated Reagan statues, and I think that spoke to the aspirational and inspirational aspect of Reagan, and most importantly, the anti-communist um, aspiration of Reagan and his visceral hatred of communism. Um, I wonder if that aspect of Reagan, which was so defining all around the world to millions and millions of people, does that stand closer to Henry Olson's version of Reagan or more Craig Shirley's version of Reagan? I, would say that's I think it's both. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't think we would dispute that. No, not at all. Reagan was an inspirational leader. Uh, Reagan remains one of the four most successful, important presidents of uh, in the history of this country alongside Washington, Lincoln, and Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah, and Reagan, uh, when he was a hemophiliac liberal New Dealer, was opposed to tyranny in the form of fascism. That's right. And he spoke about it in nearly the identical words when communism became more of a clear enemy. Uh, he always opposed the uh, self-appointed elites who felt that they should uh, have the ability to rule uh, over the many and in the name of the few whether that was fascist, communist, or um, in a soft Totalitarian, sense, yeah, anything, yeah. yes, that's right. I mean, he was just as ardently uh, anti-Nazi, anti-fascist, anti-Japanese imperialism as he was anti com He may have been more anti-communist, but, uh, but that was because of the duration and, and the real threat to the freedom yeah, of I mean, the world. Yeah, I mean, we beat the Nazis and we beat uh, uh, Imperial <laughs> Japan, and then he had to deal with communist infiltration in uh, Hollywood... Uh, movie unions uh, firsthand. He was uh, tr trying to fight for, at that time, New Deal liberalism against communist infiltration. Right. Uh, he had an agent call his home and say they would throw acid in front of his face, and he carried a, carried a, he was licensed to carry a gun for six months to protect himself. The SDS had a bullet in their headquarters with Reagan's name etched on it in the 1960s. Uh, we have time for a quick question and a quick answer, and then I have to take us out. So, gentlemen in the front. Oh, here we go. Uh, hi, I'm Martin Worcester. Um, so Reagan had no differences with Rockefeller or modern republicanism? You know, he, he, had, he had a lot of differences with them, um, but uh, in many ways Reagan did not uh, dispute the some of the innovations that they supported. He did not have a problem with the expansions of state colleges, which was one of the advocate things that uh, Rockefeller advocated. He was proud when he was governor of what he called California's model treatment for mental health. What Reagan always opposed was the state-centered view of the world, that the government was always the arbiter of all things, and that only collective action was the appropriate response. So to that extent, he was very much opposed to that wing of the Republican Party, but it was a nuanced difference. He, you know, he was supported Eisenhower when Eisenhower was opposed. He was enthusiastic about Nixon when Nixon was called into question in 1960. Um, he was uh, somebody who um, I don't think fit neatly into 
the old categories of left and right because he transcended those categories. Mm -hmm. Rockefeller is a difficult one Time. because they were actually personal friends. They liked each other. And Mrs. Reagan really liked uh, Nelson Rockefeller. They actually worked together in 1968 in Miami Beach to stop Richard Nixon from getting the nomination. They were both that concerned about Nixon as President of the United States. Great. Uh, uh, it, I, here is the... Oh, I was good. You, here, is, here is the Reagan discovery that I, you know, I'm so excited mm -hmm. about that I wanted to share it with the rest of the world. Uh, thank you, C-SPAN. Uh, <laughs> on, on page 218, we read, Reagan believed that you deserved a certain minimal standard of living so long as you contributed according to your ability. Uh, on page 267 of Henry's book, we read that Reagan believed that benefits should go to people who need them. From each according to his ability, to each according to his need. Right. Where have we heard that before? Right. 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 Um, it's seven o'clock, and sadly, I have to bring this to a close. Um, I want to begin by thanking Bill Galston. It's always a pleasure to host things with Bill. And then I'd like to thank all of our panelists, Jonah, Rui, and Craig. And finally, to offer my congratulations to Henry Olson, um, AI's good friend Henry Olson, for this new book. And please buy books. They're for sale. And Henry, and they'll, they'll all be here to autograph their books if you'd like to uh, have them do so. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.